STEM, STEM career talks. This is our opportunity to showcase different careers in STEM with Berkeley Lab scientists, along with colleagues from all over the world. My name is Elisa Vitale, and I'm the Content Instruction Coordinator for the K-12 STEM Education Outreach Program, which is part of our government and community relations office here at Berkeley Lab. As a reminder, we've turned on our live transcription. There is a button at the bottom of your screen that allows for closed captioning during the session. And also, we are recording this talk so we can share with future students. Uh, so Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory is one of the 17 Department of Energy National Laboratories located in Berkeley, California. For the past 90 years, Berkeley Lab has been recognized for its leadership in innovative research and team science. Berkeley Lab is recognized with 14 Nobel Prizes and credited with the discovery of 16 elements on the periodic table. This year, Berkeley Lab is celebrating its 90th anniversary. And we are very excited to continue our series of spring STEM career talks. Previously, we had a panel of mentors and mentees discuss the importance of mentorship in STEM careers. The recording from that talk, along with other recordings from last fall STEM career talks that cover topics like quantum science and art and STEM can be found on our K-12 program website. The link to that has just been posted in the chat box. As a little preview, in two weeks, we will be talking with researchers about entrepreneurship and how they share science solutions with the world. We are scheduling more career talks to continue through May of this year, and we will be updating our website and Eventbrite so you can see who our speakers will be for future talks. We are very excited today to talk with our panelists from across the world who are exploring the future of food. Through the lens of science, our panelists are looking at sustainability, nutrition, ethics, and flavor about the future of food. Our four panelists will first introduce themselves, talk a little bit about their career trajectory, and then we'll get into a discussion about their experiences and work. So please feel free to put any questions that you may have in the chat box, and we will get to them later on. So I would like to introduce our first speaker and get things started. Vayu Maini Rechdal is a Miller Institute fellow at UC Berkeley. So Vayu, go ahead and turn on your camera, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited uh, to be here today and uh, to, to join this amazing team and group of people sharing their journeys at the interface of science and food. So uh, I'm just going to start kind of introducing myself a little bit, you know, what I'm doing and, and, and the path that I took to get here. Uh, and hopefully we can dig into some more questions and explore uh, more topics together later um, as part of this conversation. So as uh, Alisa mentioned, my name is Vayu Mani Rektal. I am a uh, what's called a Miller Institute Fellow at the University of California, Berkeley. So I live here in, in sunny California. And basically, uh, right now you see me here at home, but uh, most of the day I look like I do in the picture there, where I'm wearing a safety goggles, a lab coat, and um, a face covering. And so my uh, work that, that I have is uh, basically I'm a I'm a scientist and I have funding from the Miller Institute to pursue my own research, to kind of pursue directions that I'm interested in. And it so happens that what I'm the most interested in in the world is science and food. So I spend my days in a lab kind of doing research on science and food. So how did I get here? Um, how did I get end up at the Miller Institute here in California doing research? So I want to talk a little bit about my trajectory. Um, being at the Miller Institute is actually uh, a chapter uh, on a journey that started a long time ago when I was very young. So I started my journey in research uh, in the kitchen. So when I was young, uh, growing up in Stockholm in Sweden, in Northern Europe, I fell in love with cooking and uh, at, at a very young age. And cooking was, was my big passion, my big hobby. As I grew older, became a teenager, I got more and more excited and interested in it. And so I kind of thought at the time that I would uh, work in food and cooking. So I moved from Sweden to New York City uh, at age 18 and um, started working in restaurants to explore that passion for cooking in a more professional context. And it was during that time in New York, I really kind of solidified that I want to work with food as my profession. I want to be, you know, smelling and, and tasting and engaging with food as my job. I also realized that, you know, the restaurant maybe wasn't the best setting for me to do that. And that kind of is what started my journey into research. Uh, I ended up going to college uh, from, uh, from New York. And in college, kind of realized that uh, there was a new angle for me to look at food. And that's what, that was through the lens of science. 
and I started seeing all these connections between biology, chemistry, physics, the things that I was learning in the classroom really relating to my interest in food. So I became interested in, in science through food uh, because I realized science became a way for me to improve as a chef and as a cook and, and learn a lot about what I was eating at home. So I've been on kind of a journey since then, uh, working in uh, restaurants, you know, cooking for people with people, working in gastronomic research. So I spent some time at gastronomic research centers in Spain, Basque Culinary Center and Fundacion Alicia, really kind of experimenting and innovating uh, around, uh, around food. And I also sort of ended up uh, doing a PhD, uh, studying uh, doing biochemistry uh, at Harvard, uh, kind of really spending a lot of time digging deep into the science and learning kind of about chemistry and biology on a very fundamental level. And um, today, uh, you know, as a Miller Fellow, I have a few different projects and uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, I'm right now kind of combining all of these interests that I've had, all these experiences that I've had. And as I mentioned, kind of bringing it to food and, um, you know, in, in a laboratory. And I'm very interested in kind of using science to improve how we uh, produce food. So, so making food production more sustainable. And I'm right now studying a group of organisms called filamentous fungi. It's a type of microorganism that lives all around us. And I'm uh, studying these organisms and kind of engineering them and manipulating them and uh, harnessing them to make food in a more sustainable way. And that includes new alternatives to animal protein. So that is kind of what I do day to day. And I'm really excited to uh, you know, have, been on, have been on this journey about cooking and science and being able to finally bring it together in my daily job. Awesome. Thank you, Bayou. And we look forward to talking with you more about your work later on. All right, our uh, next panelist is Larissa Zhou. Uh, she is a PhD student at Harvard University and a NASA Science and Tech Research Fellow. So Larissa, thank you so much for joining us and please share with us about your career path and work. Hi, everybody. I'm excited to join you. And I want to thank uh, Elisa and Bayou originally for um, getting me involved in this. Well, I'm Larissa Zhou. I'm calling from um, Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I'm currently doing a PhD in material science and mechanical engineering at Harvard. But really, I mean, that's technically what I study, but really I study science and of food. And I'm also am a NASA science and technology research fellow, which really just means that NASA is interested in my work and therefore pays for it and connects me to NASA scientists who are also interested in getting humans to eat better in space. Uh, next slide, please. How did I get to working on this? Well, when I was in middle school, I remember everybody, um, for some reason, the girls in middle school, I grew up in California, in the Bay Area, in Mountain View, actually, and everybody just liked to bake, and I didn't really get it until one day I started baking, and I thought it was fantastic. Also, I think I was a growing teenager, and I was just hungry all the time, and I loved to bake. And that continued with me when I went into college, where I went to Harvard, and I studied physics. Um, and I realized that when I was at internships that had nothing to do with cooking, what I always did at that time when there was no Instagram, I was always scrolling through allrecipes.com, just trying to figure out what I was going to cook that night for dinner, even when I was supposed to be doing real work. So at a certain point, I started asking myself, what should I do with the rest of my life? And can I do something that I already can make money, you know? support myself doing something that I was already thinking about all day long anyway. And that was sort of hard to imagine because people around me were talking about going to, you know, become hardcore physicists in grad school and going on to become professors. And nobody was talking about going to cook in a restaurant or thinking about the science of the kitchen. Um, but during that time, right around 2010, I got involved with these uh, science and cooking classes that were starting first at Harvard and later I went to UCLA to help a professor start a similar class where we were teaching really um, fundamental science uh, concepts 
but through the lens of cooking, because we're doing experiments actually all the time when we are cooking. And through that, I came in touch with chefs and scientists, food scientists, who were thinking about this exact same thing. And that's why I said, huh, I wonder, I wonder whether I can combine this academic training that I have to think like a physicist, but combine it with my true passion, something I just, uh, um, I can spend 24 hours all day long thinking about food and also all aspects of food can I combine that. And through those classes, I started meeting people who were. So I decided I'm gonna try it. Um, so I went and interned at some of the same places that Vayu did. And eventually I said, look, I think this is, this is a viable path. I, there are people doing this sort of thing and people are really interested in it. Um, so I ended up at Modernist Cuisine eventually uh, for five years. And Modernist Cuisine is a small company in Seattle where uh, we wrote cookbooks gorgeous, beautiful coffee table sort of books, but also really practical, usable cookbooks that explain the science behind the recipe. And while I was there for five years, um, I worked on bread. And um, so if you have any questions about bread, you can ask me, I can probably tell you probably more than I even thought was possible to know about bread. Um, and now here um, I, and then after that, I decided I, I, I really like it. I want to do more fundamental research. I want to really try to push our understanding of what we can do with, cook, uh, with food. Uh, so then I decided to go to grad school because you do research in grad school. And uh, I'm not sure when I will end this PhD, um, but we can go on to the next slide and I can tell you about, about what I'm working on now. So I have two, two broad topics, uh, two projects. Um, one is essentially, what do we really mean when we say al dente in pasta? You know, you can, you can eat, you can cook pasta for seven minutes and say, oh, and you bite through it. And it's like, oh, it's a, it's a little undercooked. It's a little raw. And then you cook it for another minute. And you're like, oh, that's just right. But then if you left, leave it for a minute more, it's like, ah, oh, darn it. It's, it's now too soggy, it's too soft. So from a material science perspective, can we quantify what al dente really means? Are we referring, what mechanical properties of this material are we referring to? So that's one thing I'm interested in, and basically in quantifying texture in, in a food. And then the other thing is um, different projects to improve how we, how humans currently eat and will eat in space. And space, um, I think about as just an extreme environment and it's the most extreme one out there, but it's very applicable to all sorts of extreme environments here on earth. And it gets to issues of sustainability. For example, the, this, um, uh, this photo that you see on the right is of, a, um, is of a design for a greenhouse that some um, collaborators, some teams, uh, some partners and I worked on together as a team. And they were all actually female engineers. And we submitted it to a competition at NASA. It was to design a greenhouse for Mars. So it gets to when you can't, when you, when you can't bring all your food with you, how do you grow the food? And so that needs, you have to reuse the water, you have to recycle the air. And I also have other projects where I'm thinking about how would you actually cook food? If we had a greenhouse and we were able to harvest vegetables, well, we can't expect people to just eat salad all day long. So how would you actually process the food? What, would it, what does it look like to, to cook in a zero gravity environment. Well, you don't have gravity holding the water inside the pot. So what, how else could you keep everything inside? And how would you deal with heat, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and if you wanna find out more about any of this, I'm happy to talk about it, but also you have my email and my website um, for more information. That's really fascinating. Thank you so much, Florissa. And we look forward to talking with you further during our panel discussion. Okay, uh, next up, uh, we're moving from Cambridge, Mass to Copenhagen. Uh, Nabila Rodriguez Valeron is joining us uh, from there, and she is a gastronomic scientist at Alchemist Restaurant. So, Nabila, thank you so much for joining us, and please go ahead and tell us about your work. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm super happy to be here. Even here in Copenhagen, it's super late, but I'm super happy. 
a uh, yes, I'm Navila uh, Rodriguez from Spain, but currently I'm uh, working in a restaurant, two Michelin star restaurant here in Copenhagen called uh, Alchemist. And I'm as a gastronomic science, that means I'm working between science and cooking in the kitchen. So that is the most amazing and uh, amazing uh, for me, uh, working in the kitchen, in, in a restaurant. Okay, another slide. Okay, so um, I studied at the beginning a chemical engineer and then uh, I finished chemistry. But when I finished chemistry, chemistry, I realized that I was working for a while in a lab, in a normal lab, I'm analytical chemist. So I realized that uh, I would like to connect science and, and food as well. And I didn't find a master or another degree that we, uh, uh, where I can uh, connect science and, and cooking. So I start to to work uh, to work in a in a patisserie in Australia because I went to Australia. And then when I wo uh, was uh, working there, I realized that all the recipe behind the, all the recipe uh, had a lot of science. So I was uh, um, asking the chef and he didn't reply me. So then I've been reading about the science and cooking and I found um, my master in gastronomic science in Basque Culinary Center in Spain. So I came back to Spain and I finished uh, my master there. And currently uh, I'm doing my, my PhD as well in, in gastronomic science. Also, uh, I had the opportunity to to finish my master in Harvard University. So I was uh, working as well in science and cooking. For, for me, that experience was amazing because it's the, the real connection between science and cooking. Um, a boss of my supervisor and director from Basculinary Center and, and Harvard University inspired me to continue in, in this amazing work. So now in the in the restaurant, uh, it's completely different uh, when you work in a restaurant than when you work in a lab because the time is the the times are completely different. For example, now I'm involved in different projects. For example, in uh, with different uh, projects about insects, we are working on uh, with silver butterfly and um, uh, or even for example, jellyfish, because uh, for us, uh, research about invasive species here in Derma is super important to, to discover or to introduce new uh, protein source in, in a, a Michelin star uh, menu. Also, my, my PhD is about cocumin sensation. So there, uh, cocumin sensation is a, a peptide, uh, very similar to umami. But for example, the most important and amazing part for me is you, you can decrease the concentration of fat in different food, but when you eat that food, it's the, it's the same. And also uh, during my master, I was researching and still researching about that uh, on that uh, software. It's a kind of plant that you can make foam without egg. So you can make vegan foam. And I was uh, studying the connection and the, the behavior of a software with alcohol, with different concentration of alcohol to make vegan uh, foam in a in co cocktail, uh, in a cocktail. Oh, well, that's a really cool project. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Nabila, for sharing. And we're looking forward to talking with you 
uh, afterwards, yeah. So our final presenter is Inya Rodman, and she is the co-founder and chief scientific officer of U Culture. So hi, Inya, thank you so much for joining us and please take it away. Uh, hi everyone, and thanks for having me. It was pretty amazing to hear uh, the parts and backgrounds of the other three speakers and um, actually to realize that my path is very different um, in a way because I, I was not involved with food until very recently. Um, so currently today, um, I, I, I founded, uh, co-founded New Culture where I'm uh, a chief scientist, meaning I'm uh, super overlooking and planning and designing our entire science pipeline. And at New Culture, uh, what we're doing is we are um, producing the phenomenal tasty dairy cheese that we all love, but without involving animals. Um, we are doing that by actually producing the proteins, uh, key proteins from dairy milk, uh, caseins, that are super important for functionality of all dairy products, especially cheese, uh, which I can get to um, in a minute. But um, if we look at how I came here, it's actually really uh, serendipitous and, and very unexpected. So my entire life, I focused on very fundamental research in uh, protein, always proteins, but protein biophysics, structure and biochemistry and nothing to do with food actually. I come from Southern Europe, from Croatia and I, you know, for everyone uh, here in the US, uh, I just wanted to show kind of the path because you, you might not uh, Im immediately imagine where that is. Croatia is a pretty small country uh, in the central side of Europe. And uh, I studied in capital in Zagreb uh, from undergrad at molecular biology. Um, but I, I knew I wanted to do uh, like, you know, I wanted to dedicate myself to science. And at that time, I thought it would be academic research. Um, but science in Croatia was very limited. There was very little funding. And it wasn't actually at the standard of international community. And so I worked very hard and I got a scholarship to go to, to an amazing school that you can see on the, on the right, top right, which is ETH in Zurich. Uh, it's, a, it's a very well-known polytechnic school, what would be the, you know, MIT of, of the US. Um, and I was super fortunate to, to study for my master's there where I really focused on protein structure, function, and, and, and very fundamental physics of protein, protein behavior actually. Um, but I quickly get bored with things and I, I start liking new things. And that happened there as well is where uh, I was studying these proteins in an isolated system like in vitro, but I really wanted to understand like, you know, what do these different proteins do in organisms? and how I can manipulate them and engineer them. And I got super excited about this novel field called synthetic biology, where we are actually manipulating the genes, the genomes, the, the functionalities of cells and organisms to create new functions. And so I decided I wanted to work with Professor Chin uh, at Cambridge University. Uh, and I, I was fortunate to, to be accepted and to, to do my PhD studying at Trinity College and uh, the LMB. And the LMB is a really remarkable place because it's called Laboratory of Molecular Biology because it is a birthplace of molecular biology. So the institute that I did my PhD in is where uh, Crick and Watson worked and um, uh, together with uh, Rosalind Franklin discovered the structure of DNA and where Max Perutz uh, solved the very first uh, uh, structures of that we know today of proteins, um, which were the different types of myoglobins and hemoglobins, and where Fred Sanger worked to, to actually go and win two Nobel Prizes and to develop uh, what is called Sanger sequencing today, so the most used method for uh, DNA sequencing. Um, and uh, yeah, if you, if you go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so my academic research was really all about proteins and the three topics that I worked on and studied most are actually uh, the ribosome structure and function. So those are the uh, basically machineries inside of cell that are responsible for uh, translating the genetic information and producing the, all the other proteins in the cell. Um, and my master's, I, I worked mainly on, on ribosomes, studying ribosomes and also studying different uh, uh, proteins involved in uh, what is called a regulation of cell division. So how the different types of uh, cells uh, are able to um, you know, generate two and multiple cells from one cell originally. But for my PhD, as I explained, I really wanted to um, uh, study the, com the complex system. So I went to work uh, in molecular synthetic biology, uh, uh, neurobiology actually of, of small animals, worms and flies. And uh, there, 
complexity really arises because you're looking at what these different proteins do and how you can modulate them and, and what they actually do, not just on a cell level, but on an organism level. Uh, and we, we basically wanted to correlate these functions and study the behaviors of different animals, which was super exciting. And so when you ask me how I got to where I am today, it's pretty weird and serendipitous, but my personal interests were really always um, not in food, but in understanding how we can, um, you know, reduce and slow down climate change. So I've done a lot of um, a work in my private time, uh, volunteering for startups, for NGOs, uh, uh, being politically active and petitioning actually in the UK for uh, finding new solutions to reduce our carbon footprint uh, and also reduce our waste and, and usage of um, unsustainable materials such as plastic. And so in, in, in that kind of free time almost or hobby time is how I got connected to my, to my current co-founder, Matt, uh, where we came up with this idea of um, you know, understanding we personally were, were tr trying to eat vegetarian and then vegan uh, myself and really struggled with, with replacing cheese and finding that the cheese that's currently on the market is, um, uh, you know, the, the rep, let's say replacements or vegan cheeses that are on the market are really not tasty, really not good and not even nutritional and healthy. And when we delved deep into this problem, it turned out that it's all about protein again. <laughs> and this was all about dairy protein. The dairy protein that, as I explained, um, comes in mammalian milk uniquely, casein proteins that give uh, all the key traits and properties of dairy cheese we know. So we went on to start New Culture and we were very fortunate to get accepted to a very prestigious startup accelerator program here in the Bay Area called IndieBio to get our initial funding and to later on go and raise $5 million and, and today be um, uh, a company of 10 people. And uh, our whole goal is uh, to produce, as I said, phenomenal and healthy and tasty real dairy cheese without animals. So to do that, we are using uh, synthetic biology and microbial fermentation uh, to produce these casein proteins, uh, uh, similar to how you produce beer uh, traditionally and, and other food ingredients. And then we use these proteins with other plant-based ingredients to actually make a real animal-free dairy cheese. Wow, that's really cool. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. And um, so at this time, I'm going to stop screen sharing and I'm going to ask everyone, all our panelists to come back on, turn on their cameras and we can get our panel discussions started. And also just a quick reminder to our audience that we encourage you to put in your questions in the chat box and we will get uh, to those questions as well. And so again, thank you to our panelists for joining us today. And we actually had a question come up um, earlier from someone in the audience. Um, and the question was, while you were in high school and college, who did you reach to talk about next steps and ideas and plans you had about your future? So we're going to sort of jump back into time, I guess. And um, I guess um, we'll go back to Bayou. Where is there anyone you could reach out to in high school and college about your next step? Uh, thank you for that for that great question. I, um, yeah. So so I think I think uh, I, I I felt this through throughout my journey, and I still feel like this a little bit uh, today. That you know I'm I'm very interested in food. I'm interested in science. And uh, there hasn't maybe been a clear path for how to fit those together. So it, it wasn't like, you know, if you're interested in this, here's the career you take, here's the path you take, you do, you know, X, Y, Z, and then you'll, you'll make it happen. So it's been very much kind of a, a journey of, of just at each step trying to figure out and, and really think about, you know, what could be the next thing where I can explore this further. So uh, honestly, in, I think that journey started really uh, I, when I was working in New York City and I was kind of, um, you know, working in restaurants and stuff. And then when I came to college, kind of realizing that I was, I was in this environment of, uh, you know, academic institution, there was, uh, you know, classes I had to take, all sorts of classes, but I had this interest in food. And I was like, these things don't seem related at all. And uh, it was thank you to, uh, thanks to professors that I, that I met in college, you know, mentors that I had, they kind of saw, you know, hey, what are you interested in? And I said, oh, food. And they kind of said, oh, you know, maybe there's this thing called research you could check out and, and kind of guiding me in different directions. And um, uh, it was really kind of this professors who I think took me under the wing. I will also say that Larissa, uh, who's on this panel was a big influence for me because she was like the only person I knew. She's a little bit ahead of me 
Uh, she graduated college earlier, earlier than me and stuff. And, um, you know, she was interested in this thing too. And she was kind of already doing it maybe a few years ahead. And so talking to Larissa, you know, actually somebody who's in this field and, and seeing what she's doing, um, it was very inspiring and important for me because she was kind of charting that path. Uh, and, and I was, uh, you know, in the early stages sort of following and learning from that, so. That's very cool. Uh, Larissa, do you have uh, your trailblazer? Apparently that's awesome. Uh, was there anyone in high school and college uh, that you could talk to about future plans next step? Uh, I remember um, I had a random uncle from who actually is a physicist at Lord's uh, Livermore. And, uh, and I said, it was clear to me, I said, I'm interested in science. I don't know what to study. I have to, do, I have to at least express interest in a major. And he's a physicist. I remember, I remember my parents invited him over for lunch. He was, supposed, he, he was supposed to advise me. And he just said, well, I'm a physicist. Physics is the best science out there. You should study physics. And I was like, oh, okay. And I wrote that on my application. And, um, and I don't think that was great advice. Uh, and it, I mean, in the sense that, but I really didn't know. I like, I didn't know where else to turn to. I, um, and so I just, I just said, okay, fine. I didn't hate physics. I didn't, I, I, I liked fundamentally what science, what physics meant, which is it helps explain to me how the physical tactile sensorial world around me works. That fundamentally is hugely attractive to me. But then when I went and studied physics at college, I started thinking, man, this isn't for me. I, I, I look at the people around me and very quickly it gets very abstract. I say, how does this, you know, at first it helps me explain, oh, when I spin and, you know, and put, pull my arms in, you know, and twirl around, I can spin faster. But very quickly it stops helping me explain the, the physical around, world around me. And I thought, is this phys if this is physics, then I guess I'm not a physicist. I'm not cut out to be a physicist. Um, and I guess the, the, the upshot is that when I really started like denying my interests, which fundamentally also is an interest in food um, and, and, and thinking it's okay. I, I don't see anybody around me uh, doing, doing food at that point, but then having professors where I, I, I went to my physics advisor and I, I thought it was going to be taboo saying, I don't love physics. I don't, I don't love how it is for me right now. And she said, what do you like? And I said, food. I want to work as a chef. Maybe I'm not sure. And she said, okay, why don't you do it? Like, just do what you want. And I just thought, oh, is it that simple? It's not truly that simple, but it's sort of at, at least the first step to explore it is sort of that simple. And I, and I loved then somebody else giving me permission to go and explore. And then over time also just telling myself, it's fine, explore my interest, don't deny my interest. Um, and I just, just to follow up, like somebody in the chat says, you know, I, I love food, but I don't think I'm a chemist. And I mean, honestly, I don't love physics for physics sakes, for physics sake, right? I love physics when it helps me explain what's going on when I'm trying to cook something or when, or I, I rock climb. It's helpful to know some physics then so I don't fall and break bones. That's when it's, I, I, and I would say, you know, maybe, maybe you just haven't, maybe you haven't found the, like the entryway into chemistry yet or into physics yet or into science. Um, and, um, and also oftentimes, you know, when we don't quite get it, it's not that anything's wrong with us. I, I would often say that um, science education often is pretty bad. And so maybe you just haven't been, you haven't been taught it very well. Anyway, I can go on and on, but I'll let others speak. So thank you for sharing. I think it's very powerful to hear from your professor to just like go ahead and try it. That's awesome that you got that advice. Um, and then I'll bring that same question to Navila. Yeah, because you said you had uh, some exploration going on. Yeah. Yes, because for me it was the same when I when I studied chemistry. Uh, when I finished the, my bachelor, I realized that I like chemistry, but I like food as well. 
So that's the same like uh, Larissa said. Uh, for me, the most important thing when I studied chemistry is now I can understand every scene behind the, the kitchen, every scene or every method or every reaction during the different cooking method. So I can understand. So for me, that is the most amazing part when I uh, studied chemistry. Now I understand what the, the, the important behind all the knowledge in chemistry. But at the beginning, when I was in a high school, I didn't know. When I studied chemistry, yes, but because I like science, but that's it. So after that, when I did my master, I realized, yes, now I understand why I studied chemistry. <laughs> The path may be long, but you'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, Inya, did you have um, someone you could reach out to talk yeah, about, you know, absolutely. your ideas and plans? If you so actually, um, something I didn't stress that, but actually, my life completely changed, uh, and that's how I discovered that I would be a molecular biologist and later biologist was in high school because originally most of my life I was just doing mathematics. I was actually interested in math, and everyone thought I would study math. Uh, but one thing that happened, and I'm, I'm happy to pass this information along to anyone interested, is that there is this pretty phenomenal uh, camp, summer camp, called Summer School of Science, S to the third. And it ha accidentally happens to be in Croatia, but it's actually international and it's in English. And we have a lot of American uh, kids coming uh, uh, to the school. And so back, back then, that was 15 years ago, by the way, and I was in high school and I heard about that thing and I wanted to go and I heard, you know, this is a place where you come and you have these PhD students and postdocs from all around the world that come and spend summer working with you in a lab. And you not just learn something abstract, you actually work on their project. They'll give you like, this is my research project and you're kind of working on part of it. Let's work on it for the next few weeks together. And so I was so fortunate that I was already in high school when I was doing bioinformatics project, cloning, synthetic biology, all of this work in a lab in high school, right? Because coming from Croatia, like it's, I have, we have no opportunities. It's not that I ended up just randomly going to, you know, the best universities in Europe. It's not that I, I was so much better than other people or I deserved it more. It was just that this actually, actually this summer camp really completely changed my life because what it happened is it opened up for me. Okay. I really want to study biology and molecular biology I want to do this but secondly these people became my mentors immediately so I had this whole network of people who were PhD students postdocs all around the world in different disciplines and who literally then kind of helped me get into like when I got into college helped me understand okay how can I go abroad for my master's already how can I get a scholarship they helped me write proposals even you know they helped me with many things to just like how can I actually get out there? Because it was very challenging leaving Croatia without money and getting a scholarship to cover everything and go abroad at that stage still. Um, so yeah, I would definitely say that summer school changed my life and uh, it's still my strongest network. We just had a reunion, it was like 15 years out. It still keeps going and I kept going back to the school as a mentor. So I actually had my own project there given, I had multiple workshops given and uh, it's, it's, it's the strongest network I have. So I'm happy to send you guys the details and you know apply apply and go to uh, go to Croatia next summer and do some science. Uh, a lot of it costs are covered because we try to get funding from, you know, different associations like uh, uh, pharma companies, Google, places like that. So um, yeah, just just go in and do things with your hands, go things practically and just get the network very early on. And that, that's going to really help you a lot. That's a great opportunity. Thank you so much for sharing. And it just really shows that sometimes you gotta step outside of the classroom, I guess, and like try try new things. I love it. Um, next question actually I wanted to kind of bring back to sort of the work you all do with the future of food. It was just so fascinating because the four of you have just different perspectives almost in this really new and exciting field. And so I'm just curious for each one of you, what do you individually identify as the most pressing issue in the future of food. And um, I'll take it to Larissa first. And what do you think is the most pressing issue that you're facing for future food? Um, sustainability. We all, there's a lot of us on this earth and we are all eating. Uh, and uh, 
So there's a lot of um, energy that goes into food production, a lot of um, environmental degradation that's associated with food production. Um, so in, in some ways, yeah, that's that's the over that's the overarching uh, thing for me. If you can have a if you can if you can take a whack at solving uh, climate change, where should you start? Uh, I guess you know food is close to my heart, so I, I think lots of things just come back to food. But also just looking at the data, yeah, if you can take a whack at even some uh, even at a small corner of food. Uh, whether it's the production of it, whether it's, um, I don't know, even like transportation of food, logistics, et cetera, then I think uh, that, that seemingly small whack at, the, whack at the problem is actually gonna be quite large. And it's interesting you brought up um, climate change because uh, Inya, that's actually kind of how you got into the food industry, right? Would you, if you, would you agree is that as the pressing issue? Yeah, absolutely. And just general uh, sustainability issues that are broader than just, uh, yeah, the, the, the warming and, and the climate change. But I think for me personally, that was that was very important because I was always very, uh, I would say, sensitive towards the society I live in and wanting to be part. Even though I was a scientist, I was actually always having this side to me that was very um uh, active in the society uh, in other ways. Like, for example, I was I was involved in politics since since young, actually, and not in politics in a bad way we think of politics, but more in terms of a Green Party activism, campaigning, um, uh, part of the what is we call green action back in Croatia. And so I, I just always understood that any problem that you're working on in a lab or, or in an isolated like space, right? Like, unless you make it be relevant and make it become part of society and integrate and make relevant to governments, to companies, it's just not gonna be important. It's not gonna take over. And that's what also I realized from my academic research is that you know whatever I did was exciting, but it's never gonna be applied to the real, real world. Um, and so that, that's all, all of that together kind of brought me to think that you know um, working on, it happened to be food, but for me, it's actually entrepreneurship. It's actually being, in a startup, uh, having my own my own faith and and faith of you know people that I work with chosen and and kind of working really hard for for solving a certain problem and yeah food it happened to be food because a food is a, a number one challenge these days in terms of um, you know feeding the planet in uh, ten to thirty years time with the population we have feeding the planet nutritionally and then sustainably and re realizing we have to drop the animal. Uh, sources as 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 food source uh, if we want to um, actually uh, long term be able to battle the the climate change as well and but the second part of it again is that it, it is that my background and my skill set are very useful to this field right uh, because I also was super interested in like alternative materials to plastic and did a lot of research and work on that but for example but I don't have background in material sciences and. Uh, of course, I could bridge that gap if I wanted to, but um, this was something that was really close to home where I thought I can be useful and helpful. So it was, it's kind of like a synergy of, you know, what you are interested in, what you want to achieve, and then also where you recognize that your skills uh, lie and where you think you can be most useful. That's awesome to hear. Yeah, um, Vila, do you have um, anything to add on about your pressing issue that you see? Uh, yes, yeah, for me also it's a healthy uh, to produce uh, in a healthy and sustainable way as well. But in my opinion, taking a step back to understand the diet in many cultures, for example, now uh, we have a project about insects, and there are a lot of evidence that in many years ago, people in different culture uh, was eating uh, insect as a protein source. So I think for me, it's very important to understand what change in our, in our life, life, but because for example, in Europe, uh, people is uh, super scared to eat insect. So I think uh, to study the, or to research about that moment that the, 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 the population or the society change 
I think that uh, is a, a good point to start to design our future as well. Yeah, that's really fascinating to also like take a step back, like you said, and look at where that change came in. And talking of uh, different food sources, via your research, you mentioned about filamentous fungi as well for the sustainable method. Is that, do you also agree that sustainability is the pressing issue in the future of food? Yeah, I definitely agree with everything that's been said. I think sustainability, you know, finding ways to produce food that's uh, not only you know produced in a sustainable way, but it's also delicious. So you know we have to have the human component of taste and smell and and sort of the emotional side of food as well as nutritious. You know we have to kind of fuel our, our bodies and fulfill you know our, our biological needs. So I think that's a you know very very important area and, and a growing area. A lot of smart people are coming into as evidenced, you know, by by all the people on this panel. So uh, I do think, kind of, you know, in addition to sustainability, and and I think there's kind of a bigger challenge that's maybe not as pressing, but I think will be very enabling. Like as we have this goal of sustainability, you know, that's where we want to go. Well, how do we get there? And I think one challenge there is that we've treated food so much, uh, kind of on the surface. Food science has been concerned very much with application, like the safety of food and the color and preservation. And it's been very application focused. So you just look at it on a surface level. But you know, I think in order to really innovate and transform our food system, we have to understand how does it actually work? You know, what is, you know, what it gives a food a certain texture or what is it about the proteins that gives, uh, that makes uh, cheese stretchy? I think there's this challenge that we're facing of really having to understand the mechanism and the fundamental reasons for why food is the way it is. And I think once we can start understanding that, we'll be able to, you know, really grow and develop into new areas. Um, and you know, the research research, obviously, on, on on pasta texture is part of that. You know, Inya's project on um, kind of understanding proteins and how we can use them to produce dairy-free cheese. I think that's really part of a bigger. A challenge of like, let's go deeper. Let's actually understand the reasons behind and, and, and why and how things work. The other thing that Nabila said that I think is really interesting is to consider not only one perspective of what sustainability looks like and the future of food looks like, but actually kind of looking at all corners of the planet and maybe learning from, you know, different cultures and different practices and how people, you know, this, this challenge of sustainability and feeding people is not a new idea. And um, you know, people have been faced with this challenge before, maybe not on the same scale, but definitely in their local context. So uh, you know, for example, I'm very interested in um, a topic of food waste. So how can we take all this waste, all this food waste that we're throwing out, how can we convert it into human food? And this has been kind of a popular sort of idea in the restaurant world and the culinary world that you know, waste is food, we can transform it. Well, that's not a new idea. Uh, for example, on the island of Java in Indonesia, people have been fermenting food waste to produce meat substitutes for hundreds of years. So it's a traditional practice where people are faced with food shortages and, and you know, limits in, in meat. And they figured out how to take food waste, things that would other, otherwise be discarded, and through the process of fermentation, turn it into human food. And so I think that's just an example of kind of that you know, in different local contexts uh, across the world, uh, uh, there's inspiration that we can gain and also uh, we can learn from. And, and I think that's a, a sort of an important angle to consider. Thank you, Vai. Yes, and absolutely the multicultural facet of food is first of all fascinating, but also it's so much that we can learn absolutely right from different cultures. Uh, we had a question earlier from our audience about what classes, books, and or resources do you recommend for people interested in food science to read? There are classes, books, resources that people can look into if they're interested. Well, uh, Laura says you're unmuted, so <laughs> I'm wondering if <laughs> you had a resource or something you were willing to jump in to share. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so let's see. Um, I, yeah, depending on your level, um, like you can just go straight into textbooks. You know, there are textbooks on like on uh, well, okay, yeah, there's textbooks on every single like niche topic you could ever want because uh, 
that's a that's a that definitely exists. Um, if you wanted to get excited, uh, because textbooks often aren't exciting, um, then I think um, there are a lot of, there's a good number of books that kind of straddle this like pop size slash cooking uh, gap. Um, modernist cuisine, where I used to work, I think you just look at those photos and I didn't take those photos. We had, we had in-house photographers. We worked with them to take those photos. I think just like, you know, because food is, I mean, we, we, we're talking about the science of food, true, true, but food is sense, it's sense, it's beautiful. It's, we eat with our eyes first. You just look at those photos and you're, and you're wondering, you look at the close up of a blueberry and you're like, whoa, it has these orange specks inside. I had no idea. I wonder why that is. Um, that's really, so it's not even just books, it's often other sorts of media too. Um, I think uh, Kenji Lopez Alt does a really good job writing about um, how to apply just not even hard, like deep, you know, esoteric science, scientific concept, just, but just scientific thinking, how to think uh, methodically in the kitchen in a very approachable way. Um, I'll, I'll write more in the, in the chat if I, if other things come to me. But if I can just Thank add to, to, to Larissa, uh, definitely, because I was surprised that was not first thing she thought is modernist cuisine is actually um I, i'm so happy to hear that uh, to learn that you were um from uh, the modernist cuisine lab and that's something that uh we've discovered recently i've been pretty impressed with and uh they're working actually on pizza their new thing is pizza and and we are making cheese uh, and we're actually making a uh, pizza as well we're making cheese that will go on pizza so we're becoming pizza experts ourselves at new culture even though we originally are a science and a cheese company and we had some um, phenomenal uh, learnings from looking at materials from modernist cuisine and, and their work. So yeah, I, I think that's, that's a place that got me excited for sure. For me, another book super interesting, if somebody wants to start in, in science and cooking, Harold Magid book, because you can understand super easy the evolution of aroma, uh, the texture, how, uh, with different temperature, you get different uh, aromas or even different uh, texture of protein. So for me, Harold Magee books is super amazing as well. Yeah, I agree with that. That that is the book that made for me science relevant for the first time. I, I've been learning science and you know thinking about it, and then you know, didn't really make the connection to my passion and my interest in cooking. And the book called On Food and Cooking by Harold McGee really showed me like this whole new world. Uh, he writes about, it's an old book from the 1980s, very groundbreaking back then, really like talking about, you know, what is food as, as Nabila said, aroma, texture, flavor, you know, what, what gives rise to, to the things that we see in the kitchen. And so that book, I, I think it's an amazing introduction. It's pretty easy, you know, uh, easily digestible. Um, and it just it just kind of shows you that connection, I think, initially. And it's it's encyclopedic. You know, you can it's a very large book, so you can find you know sections that maybe you find more interesting and stuff. I I think that book is amazing. It was written in the eighties, but it's still so relevant today. That's awesome. And uh, we've been posting some of the stuff that we answered into the chat box for our attendees. Uh, we're almost at the hour. So um, we just got a last question in from our audience about uh, is there a way to get into food science careers without being in the lab most of the time? Um, actually, Nabila, do you want to answer to that? Because I believe you're working in a restaurant right now. Uh, yes, for example, I call my lab because it's not a lab, it's test kitchen. So uh, for me, the most amazing part is when you work in a normal lab, you can't taste anything because everything is not edible. But in my lab, everything is edible. And you research, of course, and when you go to the kitchen, you can taste, you can smell. Uh, and I think uh, this is completely different than when you uh, were in a lab, for example. 
of course, a lot of experiment, I need to go to the university, of course, but almost of the time, I spend a lot of time in front of my laptop as well, researching, uh, reading, but uh, when I go to the kitchen, my test kitchen, uh, even I, we have a lot of equipment like a normal laboratory, but everything there is edible. And when I research, uh, always, uh, if something is not edible, always I need to change the recipe to, to bring to the, rest, the, to, the, to the kitchen. So I think that's for me is the most fun and amazing part of my of my work. That's pretty neat. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so actually, then like Valuers, I guess you guys are sort of in this, I guess lab setting a lot. Um, do one of you want to tackle saying like, hey, maybe it doesn't look, it isn't that traditional setting of a lab, right? That's sort of kind of what I figured from uh, you guys' talk earlier. So perhaps it's not, well, how would this like challenge that like a viewpoint of saying like working in a lab? It's not, is it, it's not like working alone, right? It's not like working in a corner. Vayu, can you speak to that? Even in working in a lab in this exciting field, does it look a bit different from what we normally think? Yeah, I think it's important, you know, when, when we ask that question, oh, you know, uh, maybe I want to avoid the lab. I mean, I would probably have said the same thing in high school because to me it was, you know, being a scientist and what that looks like, look, I had perceived it to be in a very, you know, it's a very specific thing. You're alone in a corner and you're, you know, pipetting and, and you're just kind of, you know, sitting there and it's not engaging at all. I kind of have learned that, you know, I'm sort of redefining for myself and also looking at the people, you know, on this panel and around me that, you know, being working in science can look many different ways and working in a lab can look in many different ways. And I think kind of uh, uh, becoming aware that the way we learn it in, in high school, maybe even in college can be very different to what it looks like, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a, maybe in a more professional setting outside of that kind of academic environment. And so, you know, for me, that means that I actually get to collaborate with, with chefs and, you know, go to local food producers and, um, you know, I hope to visit Alchemist restaurant one day to see their amazing test kitchen, right? There's, there's all these, this kind of synergy and exploration that, that's part of the lab work. And it's not really that stereotype that I think is portrayed. And that's kind of connects back to what Larissa mentioned, you know, earlier of sort of uh, what, what physics seems to be versus what it can be. Uh, and I think being in the lab, what it seems to be or what it can be. And I think working with food has really showed me a different way. Awesome to hear, yeah. Um, how about you, Inya? I guess you, you also work in sort of like a startup entrepreneurship environment too, but... Um, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. That? Yeah. yeah, it's very interesting because someone actually asked this question that in our company, we have almost like four or five areas of, of, of science that all feed into this big pipeline, but they're pretty different types of work. And so our work starts with like very much more like of a... Of a typical, you know, uh, synthetic biology, molecular biology work in a lab that you will find in a biotech rather than in a food company, because we are actually engineering these microbes to specifically produce what we want, and that is the casein protein. So we have to like tell them not to produce other things that they naturally want to, but this protein instead. And we have to optimize the way we grow them and scale that up to these big tanks and then harvest that protein, be able to recover that protein efficiently and get it to a certain standard of purity and quality. And only there is when it starts for us to be like um, a food science. And actually, the, ultimately it is, we, that's what we realize we are a food company, we're not a biotech company because ultimately we, all we care about is the product. It's product, 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 making this phenomenal product. So we do have uh, our food science lab uh, and kitchen separately to our, to our main lab. It's all within the same kind of space. Um, but it's kind of a, a cleaner, uh, oh, not cleaner, but like a different different place, uh, place of a different um, standard and instruments and types of work that you do compared to the regular lab we have, where we just bring in the protein, right? We just give to our food science team um, the protein, and that's what they actually work and, and, and formulate with. And as I said, it expanded into also a kitchen and now having a proper pizza oven and actually making pizza because our first uh, cheese that we're producing is going to be application is going to be pizza because that's where uh, that's the most exciting that's where the biggest gap is out there for anyone who knows um, the field of, of plant-based cheese 
And so, so yeah, it's, it's very interesting and unique environment where you have the office and then you have these two labs and you kind of go between them and it's like two different worlds, but they have to meet, they have to communicate, they have to understand the requirements. And um, yeah, it's super exciting, super, super interesting to see. And just for myself, how much I learned about, about food and, and dairy and cheese and uh, it's, it's just like crazy. Someone mentioned this, I think about uh, another topic was it al dente pasta or, or or something else but I literally never thought I would know this much in my life just about cheese like when I ate cheese before I just you know took it for granted but it's it's yeah it's super exciting yeah that is exciting Laura so that's that was your topic you know everything about bread now <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then and then you know I why why am I working on pasta now? Um, it's because I I started out thinking about texture. Um, we texture is so key to making food delicious, and 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 we have some words you know, and some languages have more texture uh, descriptors than others, but we have some words. But everybody's sense of stickiness or crunchiness is different. Uh, if we're really trying to tune texture to achieve a certain a certain threshold in our, you know, the ideal chip crunchiness or whatever. We don't really understand what structurally is making is making that. Um, so I said, oh, I want to do that, and I and I I wanted to start working with apples, but then apples are sort of hard because there there's um, there are cells, there's a lot of, and then so I said, okay, let's back it, let's back it off. So I ended up on pasta for a variety of reasons, but I thought like, why pasta? I I spent five years thinking about bread, can I please move on from carbs? But, um, but it, it's, a good, it's a good model system for trying, at least as an exercise for me to make sense of, um, make sense of texture. And also I, I think about seriously thinking about, okay, if I can do this, if I can try to make sense of texture in pasta, what does that mean when we say we wanna make plant-based proteins fold and create a texture that's, that mimics, um, um, you know, tissue that makes, that mimics um, animal tissue. In any case, um, yeah, so to answer this, um, this um, uh, question, you know, can you, can you not work in a lab? I think similar to other people say, maybe I just, I just ask, maybe you can just define the sort of lab you don't want to work in and then just avoid that. Because there are all sorts of different flavors of science to be done. Um, you know, there are food scientists at NASA and, um, and I'm doing some like advanced work where I'm trying to figure out how, how to like, you know, make a pot that can work in zero gravity. But, the, but one of the food scientists at NASA told me, he's like, do you know what I thought about yesterday? It turns out the, the astronauts want cheese in, on the ISS. So now I have to think about how to keep the cheese cold uh, from like, I have to maintain a cold, a cold chain for the cheese. I have to keep the cold from, you know, whenever like it comes out of our production facility to the launch pad, it's sitting there on the launch pad. It's getting, it's, it's being sent off. So he's, he's a food scientist, but he's thinking about something very, very different. And that's a really interesting problem. How do you keep cheese from melting on its way to the ISS? And so if you know what you want to avoid, if you don't want to just be plugging, um, plugging away at something where you are doing fundamental research, let's say, and you're not in, you know, some people are very happy that, that one bit of information might affect a whole, a whole industry in the future, who knows when. Some people are happy with that. Some people say, no, I want to be much closer to application. Um, some people, I, I think for me, I, I really like cooking because I know, you know, 10, day, 10, 10 minutes later, did it taste good? Did it give somebody diarrhea? You know, is it, is it, is it the wrong texture? So you can figure out what you like and then, and then, um, and then design your career that way. Yeah, thank you. And well, we are past the hour. So thank you to our audience for sticking with us. Thank you to our panelists for all your time. We are out of time, though. I feel like we could go on and on and talk about this super fascinating topic. I've learned so much today. So um, I once want to tell everyone that we did record this talk. It will be available on our website once we upload it uh, in a couple of days. And just thank you once again to our panelists so much for the time to speak with us today about this super exciting field and from all these different perspectives. It was absolutely super fascinating. And also thank you to the audience for the, all those great questions and for being with us for this past hour. 
I just wish everyone has a great rest of their day or night. <laughs> and thank you, everyone. Goodbye.